All right, guys, a few things real quick here before we dive head first into the uh, podcast with Tim and Christy with Tractor Time from Tim. I believe this is about the 15th episode we've recorded here on the Few Points from Perfect channel and a lot of good comments. The uh, proof of concept seems to be going pretty well. So just kind of let me know below if you guys, if this is something you want to see us continue. And if so, who else you'd like to see us have on the channel or on the podcast here and uh, interview. Now, if you guys have known from the beginning, this has been quite the learning curve from Jason and I with all the uh, audio levels and settings and stuff like that and it still is a learning curve unfortunately it's a little bit embarrassing Uh, Tim and Christy are very well known for their excellent audio on their channel and this audio in this particular podcast is not the best but I think you guys will still enjoy it so hopefully we will have this up on a streaming service soon more platforms than just here on YouTube so stay tuned for that like I said I apologize the audio is not to the quality we would like on this particular podcast but a lot of good information great conversation with Tim and Christy and I still think you guys will thoroughly enjoy. So let's get started. All right, guys, this we're back with another episode of A Few Points from Perfect. We're on the road today. We are in, is this Lebanon, Indiana? Lebanon, Indiana. I, I got my first thing right. So we got the uh, the one and only Tractor Time with Tim, Christy, and Tim. First off, thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah, thanks for coming. This is this is exciting. I think we've recorded like three podcasts off air just sitting here talking. We finally decided to sit down and actually, actually record it. So... Uh, I guess first off, we'll give everybody a little bit of a background. You guys operate the YouTube channel Tractor Time with Tim. Where you guys kind of, I kind of give it the entry level to the compact tractor uh, market. Would that be a fair statement? That'd be a fair statement. We are, uh, to date, we're the largest channel dedicated to compact tractors. And it's kind of a unique niche that not a lot of people are involved in, but yeah. And I will say rightfully so. You guys have done an excellent job of what you've done. So I just want to kind of go back in time a little bit. Obviously, you didn't start off here where we're at today so how did we get to Tim as a kid to tractor time Tim today so I'll let you go back as far as you want and, and bring us up to speed and, and we got Christy which is uh you're the technical behind the scenes yeah. uh better half I guess there's all kinds of adjectives we yeah, could throw in the video and the editing video in the editing wish I had one of those Tim yeah <laughs> yeah well you can't have her she's uh, fully employed at this point she's so doing that's... a good job on your side <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> we, we shall talk off camera. Okay. <laughs> so, did you grow up in Illinois, is that correct? I grew up in Illinois, in the southern part of the state. Actually, not too far from where you live now, actually. Uh, pretty close to the, to the Indiana State Indiana farm. side. And uh, I grew up on a farm. Some of our videos you'll still see have some of the farm family yep, still in them. Um, there just wasn't enough farmland to go around uh, for me to stay around. Uh, just wasn't enough income possibility and i had an interest in software interest in computers so now I went you, that direction you have a, a couple siblings i believe i've seen them on the channel from time to time yeah i have a, a, a brother his name's tom and and he is taking over the farm okay my dad passed away this summer he was he was working and i've with, seen him on several videos yeah. especially the ones working at the church like a pretty incredible guy yeah he is an amazing or was an amazing man and uh, yeah so it's it's pretty you know pretty special to go back to the farm but uh, we, we just moved away from it, like I said, and I got into the software world. For that whole time that I was in software, I always had this you know, itch to go back to the farm. We actually bought some farmland back there to have a little bit of ties. So, so did you, um, I guess you grew up in Illinois, you graduated high school there. Did Went a, to the University of Illinois. The University of Illinois. So you spent most of your childhood and adolescence in, in Illinois. So I have to ask, somewhere along the lines, is this where we met Christy at? No, no. Uh, actually, right after college, after I graduated from the University of Illinois, we I moved to North Carolina and went to work for IBM. Really? Yeah. So, so back in, uh, we don't have to give exact dates here, but IBM was like the big one back in the day, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, until I got there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I started work in 1989 at IBM, and IBM was was meant to be your lifelong career. And oh. they held our hands. They had they, they, they took care of all of my moving and, you know, anytime we had any question with a moving company, you didn't go complain to the moving company, you complained to IBM, who wow. in turn complained to the moving company for you. They, they, they kind of embraced your whole life. Well, I caught just the end of that. Uh, I was there just a year or two and then it began to kind of unravel the a little world bit. Changed. You know, I don't want to get too far off subject here, but it's, um, that's the way, like, my 
parents and grandparents, that was the culture, is you look for a lifelong job. You didn't, right. you look for a career, I guess, is where that term maybe even come from. You didn't, I think a lot of people today, they, they work here until their time runs out or their fuse burns out and they, and they go on somewhere else. But a lot of it had to do with the culture of the company too. Is it they, really did. They, they invested in you, whether it be IBM or, or I'm thinking of Tell City Chair back home or, or right. GE was a big one that was in our area as well is they invest in you as an employee and they had full intentions of you working there from the day you started your work career to the day you uh, retired. That's exactly right. You mentioned Tell City Furniture um, and I grew up around a table yeah. in my dining room that was Tell City That's, Furniture. Uh, they still have it today and it's still holding up. It's, that, it's, it was a stunning company. But yeah, it was intended to be your whole career. Uh, probably my dad was most fearful of my life choices the, the day that I told him I was leaving IBM. He, he thought that was he thought that was a, a horrible idea. Really? And uh, yeah, so he was you know, he was really nervous you know for, for our future. Well, I guess you know, kind of going back in time and looking from his perspective, that was a little bit of an uncharted territory, possibly of somebody leaving a company they invested that much time in. Yeah. To. Um, I don't know if chase a dream would be a good way to put it, but at, at that stage, you know, we were just going to another company. I mean, uh, you know, it, it went from the old model of "we'll take great care of you, you may not get the highest salary," to I went to a company who we may not take take such great care of you, but we're going to pay you really well, right? And and that's where IBM lost out was they they couldn't make that transition right. very well back at the time. Now, for those of you who are still familiar with IBM, it's a totally different company now. So anything I'm saying is really about the this this old IBM that was a, a generation ago, right? Yeah, it, it's got the wheels turning in my head. Of uh, I get the question a lot of why I don't work in corporate America, and I've had a lot of experiences working in corporate America here and there, and family members or good friends that are working in corporate America, and uh, my answer is always I like being in control of my own destiny. Sometimes that's not always a good thing, Tim, but, you know, if it, if it goes bad, it's my fault. If it goes good, it's my fault. And I've I just seen a lot of people, um, they get decisions made because they're a number on a spreadsheet, not a person, and that just kind of never really sat really well with me. So that's kind of why I've always done my own thing. But the flip side of that is that's a good thing for a lot of people, too. There, there's people that fit into that mold and need to fill those spaces and, 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 and go down that route. So For me, I think it changed over time. Um, for the longest time, software was still a, a, a kind of a new industry. I guess it was almost the, the new wild, wild west. It was the, the area that hadn't been explored yet. Wild, wild west is a great way to describe it. And so for a lot of that time, there wasn't set rules. There wasn't set structure. You know, I, I, I would look at what the accountants did, and I was like, boy, am I glad I'm not doing that. They would have a, a stack of papers on one side of their desk in the morning. And, that stack better end up by, by on the other side of the desk by evening or else they had built. Well, it was hard to measure our productivity and, and so we could kind of make our own rules of time. Yeah. Well, it's no longer the wild, wild west in software. It's a, it's, a, it's a different world. It's much more structured. But that's probably a great thing, but right. it doesn't fit my personality as well. Right? And, and you've got to start somewhere and build. There's reasons why it was the way it was and is the way it is, I guess. But what 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 attracted you to the software? Is it because it was new and unknown at the time? Is that what? Well, yeah. When I grew up, uh, I, I loved Lego blocks. Okay. And so I would play with Lego blocks. I would build farm equipment, and all, you know, because that's what we did. We, we you know, as a farm farm kid, I found software to be what I considered the perfect world because. When, when I would play with Lego blocks, I would always run out. I, I would only have three or four of the universal joints, or I would only have enough chain to maybe do one little piece of chain. But when I got in the software world, it seemed like there was an infinite amount of, of toys well, if, that I could If you play needed with. a piece, you could create it. Yeah. And that and, was part of the challenge. Yeah, and so I, I found it to be just like Legos in a sense, but, but kind of an infinite supply of every piece I wanted. And so I, I, I don't know, I, I found that. Now, I, I felt like I could visualize what was going on in the software, and I, I did, it took me a long time to realize that other people didn't have that same I was going to say, that absolutely fascinates me, because whenever you ask me about software, I would struggle to get you what version's on my iPad. <laughs> you know? and, I, and I know there's so much more to that, and it, and it intrigues me, but my, my brain don't compute the same way yours does. Is that... A fair way to say that, I guess. Yeah, I think it is, and and the fascinating thing is, is that we really don't understand how other people's brains work. Yep. 
you know, I mean, you can probably talk to a, a, a typical software guy, and, and you can't understand why he doesn't see why water won't run uphill. Right. And, and I say that bluntly, I mean, but it doesn't look like it's uphill. What, what's, what's obvious <laughs> to one is not obvious to the other. Yeah. Which is what makes the world an awesome place it is, is because we all got our own strengths and yeah. weaknesses. And, and we have to learn to appreciate each other. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Respect everybody's strong points and everything. So, um, Sorry, I didn't mean to go too far off subject there, but back to, so you were at IBM for? I was at IBM for eight years, and then over the next, you know, 20-some years, I was at several different tech companies. I went from the career at one company approach to just bounce around to wherever. So did this uh, did this endeavor require you traveling, living in different locations, or were you able to work from home? Or? Well, we moved from North Carolina. We lived uh, north of Chicago for a little while. But that, that was, was interesting. An <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and that was about 15 months. Um, but I met him when he worked at IBM. Okay. There in the research time apart. Ah, uh, yeah. We had so him. I was from North Carolina. Gotcha. I went to the University of North Carolina, graduated, got a job, and needed a church, and showed up at a church in singles group. And there was eight guys in the singles group, and only like... Two, three girls. So you thought you had pretty good odds. Yeah, pretty good odds. I won. <laughs> I think you did pretty well for yourself, sir. <laughs> so I guess uh, I don't. I don't want to skip over that, but that's where you guys uh, become one. Is is now you didn't uh, apologize here, following along a little bit. Did you actually work at IBM as no, well? No, I had a degree in chemistry. Okay. So I worked for pharmaceutical companies. Gotcha. At that time. So we the met at church. so the church was the. We met at church, and yeah. it turned out we worked right across the road from each other. Yeah. Awesome. Interesting. So just totally different career fields. And then uh, I guess as your career changed paths, she was willing to go along for the ride? Yep. And usually wherever he moved, I could find a job. And that worked out pretty well then. Yeah. So. I think, uh, I'm not sure, but at one point she had never interviewed for a job that she wasn't offered. That's, that's, that's uh, impressive. Yeah. I can't say that. <laughs> it's it, happened once later in life. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's pretty impressive. So from North Carolina, we go to north of Chicago. Yeah. That had to be quite a bit of a geography change there. Yes. Geography change. We wanted to try something different. Uh, we didn't have children at the time, and we thought it would be fun to try something different. Um, we lived just near the Six Flags Amusement Park up there um, north of Chicago. It's, okay. it's on 94. We actually got lake effect snow, so we would have a, probably an inch of snow every morning. Really? That and, and that was just a totally Tim, different Tim, North Carolina girl. Did yeah, like I was that. gonna say Tim smiling and Chrissy's over here going, I don't know about this. <laughs> it snowed on um, Halloween. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so it was it was different for us. We were we were ready to move away from that pretty quickly. Uh, spent a little while in Columbus, Indiana, working for Cummins. Oh yeah. Essentially. Oh yeah. And, uh, it was a consultant role for Cummins, and then we moved to Indianapolis? I think uh, Cummins, is, I don't want to get too far off base here, but that's a large corporation that's based right here in our home state. Yeah. And uh, I'm personally not a huge Cummins fan. <clears throat> Excuse me, but um, I don't think they get the credit they're due for the size of company they are. They are um, they fly a little under the radar. The size of operation they got going on down there and the, and the amount of product they put out and the, the things they develop and stuff like that. I got a couple of cousins that still work there today as engineers, and it's they're a very forward-thinking company and have yeah. been for a long time. And it's engineered right here in Indiana. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's that's pretty impressive, and and yeah. it, they are quality quality engines, you know, yeah. quality machines. So, so uh, the uh, you got my attention there. I have, see Tim. I'm learning things. That's the point of the podcast. <laughs> is I learn things. I had no idea you work at Cummins. So um, the whenever you were there at uh, Cummins, what um, what role did you have there? You said it was still in the software? Yeah, I was still doing software work. Uh, uh, the engines were transitioning to more software-based. You know, so the, that was my question. Is that actually in the, um, actually in the um, computer software of the engine itself? Software of the engine itself. Really? Um, um, my mic is falling off here. So sure. <laughs> Technical difficulties um, over here. Could yeah, you give him a hand real quick so there and get his uh, mic back on? Well, I think I may have got it. Oh. Never mind. We got a master in the, the the controller of the of the engine. Um, there were a bunch of rules, that, mm-hmm. you know, that they would try to make sure that a particular parameter didn't get out of. Oh, I'm very familiar with this. Okay, and uh, so what we were making was uh, basically a, a a tool to try to make sure that none of these parameters violated any of those rules. 
it didn't work out like it was supposed to, but you know, it was a, it was, you know, it's one of those attempts. So would this have been about the late nineties, early two thousands, just out it would of have been, uh, mid mid nineties. Yeah. yeah. So one thing you may not know about me that's a little bit interesting is I actually went two years of college in Indianapolis for Lincoln Tech, and uh, I went there and I went straight to work for Mack Trucks. Okay. And this was uh, early 2000s, and Mack was a little bit behind in getting electronic engines in their trucks. So 99, 2001 was the first year for it. Well, I show up fresh out of college, and all these little mechanics see these computers on these trucks, and they're lost. Yeah. So uh, I spent three or four years up in Joliet, Illinois, and I was the computer programmer, software guy for Mack Trucks on the dealership level, and I always talked to the software guys at Mack, and we'd go in there and reflash for software and work on these parameters and give input back on uh, the uh, uh, diagnostic tools and stuff like that. So it's, uh, it's just interesting for me to hear you say from the, from the uh, OEM side, you know, kind of what was going on behind the scenes back then. And I wasn't there long enough to really to, to really get fully in-depth knowledge of what was going on. We were only there seven months, I think. Really? Yeah, um, and um, it, it just didn't work out for us. And then we had this opportunity. I came and worked for Thompson, who made the RCA TVs. Oh, yeah. And that was my first exposure to professional video, you might say. Um, so we, you know, I did a lot of, of software work with video compression tools and uh, DVD players and some just some other aspects there. And, and back then, that was like, uh, that's, that's, we, we kind of take some of that for granted today, the things we're able to do with these apps on our phone or software on our computer. But back then, that was a big it thing. It took a really powerful PC to edit video back then. Yes. Uh, even standard definition video, it, it, it was all you could do to edit it. I, I, I bought my first specific video editing PC just as a hobby, and, and it was very expensive. And never really utilized it. <laughs> well, I guess that was my next question. Are we editing like family vacations or what? Yeah. Or just so when my daughter was born, uh, that would have been a '97. We we got a uh, the first digital video camera that came out. Okay, um, it was a mini DV camera, and we've got all this video now that we've shot over all those years. And uh, so when we finally started YouTube, jumping ahead she was quite comfortable with that and so was so was Christie's we, we had spent a lot of time just on our own playing with with video so much so that uh, I, I think my daughter Katril got tired of the question I would always ask well what do you think Katril what do you think Katril <laughs> um, and she would uh, but she would have an answer right? right so we we would if we went on vacation somewhere we would just have a certain set of questions we always said what was your favorite part right and even at, at two and three and four years old she was able to answer those questions well, just we've got documenting yeah right. just yeah. just the typical documentation and and uh, during that time we we learned some aspects of, of how to keep a video from being boring because we didn't want to edit at all um, and we would but yet it was almost impossible to watch if if you just leave the camera right. running too long. So video structure. Yeah, it's yes. it's it's hard to do. So one of the tricks we learned was is if if I was holding the camera, I would have my finger on the record button and I would be asking myself all the time, is it boring yet? Is it boring yet? Is it boring yet? <laughs> and as soon as you could answer yes, it's boring. It's you time to shut her down. Press stop and uh, and you'll find another opportunity to have something interesting. In I mean, <clears throat> I don't want to skip forward too far, far, but isn't it wild, them skills you've learned then, how you were able to apply them now, though? Yeah, I had no idea. I right, mean, right. We were fascinated by video. A lot of other folks were taking still photos at the time. Um, but we, we were fascinated by video. I, I liked both the motion, uh, uh, like when I'm looking at a memory of my daughter, I want to see her crawling around on the floor, right. uh, not just a, a still picture, but I also like hearing her. Yes. So the audio yeah. is uh, a key importance. It's kind of like a text versus a phone call. It's hard to get the emotion and the feeling out of a text like you do a phone call or, or something like that. And both of our parents uh, live in different states, so we would actually, he would burn a DVD, and I would put it in the mail at the time and send to my parents or his parents so they could see their granddaughter. That's awesome. <coughs> it's uh, crazy how times change. I, I remember my family doing a lot of the same things, and just now we got Facebook and everything we got going today, how, how different it is. Yeah, yeah. so we, um, I got to where I didn't, I was just getting tired of software, and 
we prayed for a long time. God, find us, find us something else. I, I, I want to get out of this. I, I just don't want to do the same kind of career that I'm going through. And what we saw was that uh, there wasn't really any answer. I mean, right. I just was getting no answer whatsoever. So finally I said to Christy, I said, you know, let me buy this little tractor. You know, I, and she says, well, you don't need a little tractor. I said, no, I don't need a little tractor at all. So do you, do you mind me asking, were you, were you living in town? Were you living on a farm? Were you... We were living in Carmel, Indiana. Okay. I uh, had four Which is, tenths of an acre. Uh, generically, is the north side of Indianapolis. Yeah. Suburb it's, of Indianapolis. It's, it's the highest, one of the highest end suburbs of, in Indiana. Right. It's probably, it's probably one of the more wealthy areas. We, li- we always teased about it. We lived in below average Carmel housing. Um, and, and, we had a, and we had a very nice house, but it still was, it was you know, it wasn't, it wasn't anything fancy. Right. But uh, I wanted this little tractor. We had no need for it whatsoever. And so I, I finally convinced Christy that that's what I needed. And um, he so, begged. Oh, I had so much fun with that. I, I mean, we got that tractor, and it was it was just something every day to play with. It, yeah. it was, again, I had no need. It was, uh, it was kind of a probably a combination of two things. It was kind of a new lease on life, and it probably took you back to your childhood a little bit. It did. It, it was a memory of the farm, and I could and I could could talk to my family about uh, just certain things, you right. know, um, some of the hydraulics or or what kind of accessories I needed for the three point hitch. And now I'm. Um... I'm going to go back here just a little bit because it, it brings me up a question I'm a little curious about. Whenever you were actually living on the farm, were you highly involved with the farm or, was, or were you kind of hands off at the farm at that time? Well, when I was still on the farm, yeah. I mean, I I, uh, I was full time just like everybody else. So you right? had some agriculture experience, oh, yeah. tractor, okay. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, we, we did a, back then we didn't have a lot of no-till, so we did a lot right, of tillage. Right, right, right. And so we had... Uh, we had two articulated four-wheel drive tractors when I was a kid. Um, Approximately how many acres did the family farm? Uh, back then, probably 2,000. That was... Maybe uh, 1,800, I don't know. That's a pretty good size farm for... For back then, yeah. yeah. And uh, so I had a, a, a four-wheel drive articulated tractor. My, mine was a Massey. Massey really? Ferguson 4880 uh, at the time. Um, I think we bought it in 1980. Wow, and that was when I say it was mine. I didn't pay for it. I mean, the farm, yeah, it was my my responsibility. Now, did the did the farm own the two thousand acres, or did you guys rent part of that? No, uh, it was it was some some owned and some rented. Gotcha. So combination of kind of what a modern farm is today. Yeah, and and uh, uh, it was pretty well structured. They had a they had a financial approach that worked really well. Kept everything pretty organized. Gotcha. So it it was well structured. Um. And then, of course, when I went to college, I w- didn't have as much time right. on the farm. So uh, during high school, I worked really hard on the farm. So you were a typical, what would be considered back then, a farm kid. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and I'm sorry to regress there a little bit, but I guess fast forward into years later, you're, you're back to buying a tractor. So you're not completely green at this. You've got a little bit of experience. and Yeah. Um, and even, even while we were working, you know, even while I was working the software job, we would go back and help. You know, I would take my vacation time to gotcha. help with harvest. Uh, uh, some years more than others. Some years it was, you know, harvest was tougher than others. And, right. Uh, you know, uh, one year my dad had uh, uh, heart surgery right during harvest, and Ooh. I drove the combine for most of the season. Um, so, yeah, you know, there's there's always been a lot of... I, I do remember a recent video of you possibly driving a combine that didn't go so well. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I got a big promotion that day, if I recollect. I, yeah. uh, in the morning, I, I was just uh, the guy that went and got lunch. And yes. Then, and then I got promoted to be able to drive the combine. I was all excited, and then the first thing I did is drove off in the ditch. Yeah, and then you got fired. I got fired. <laughs> had to come home in utter humility. Well, you know, they always tell me if you're making mistakes, at least you're doing something. <laughs> so. I did understand his desire to have a tractor, though, when he asked. We had a little riding lawnmower. I knew we didn't need it, but I thought, okay. And maybe it might be worthwhile for you to talk a little about your background, because yeah, even absolutely. though it was in North Carolina. Yeah, so I grew up on a farm, too, but we only okay. had about 150 acres. My dad worked a full-time job, but farmed on the side. Um, I think I learned how to drive a tractor when I was eight or nine and worked in tobacco until the week before I went to college. Really? I don't, that kind of surprised me. I don't... Uh... Remember, I think of tobacco. North Carolina is not a, a region I think of. Oh, really? 
I, you know, of course, we're Kentucky's right by us, and it's kind of big down there and a little bit south. But that, that, and Kentucky grew a different kind yeah. of tobacco. They grew burley tobacco. That yeah. shows you how much I know about tobacco. And they like, harvest the whole plant and hang yep, the whole plant. Still do it. They still okay. do it. Yeah. That's not the way we did it. They would go over the field multiple times, and you only pulled the ripe leaves off the bottom. Really? So at each time, it was probably four to five leaves, and there was a big mechanical people-driven harvester that had, I think there was eight people on board. It took a lot of people back yeah, see, It sounds like a lot of manpower. So I started driving the tractor when I was nine. Okay. And just down the, the row, and then got different jobs as time went on, but... Um, and then I'll help my dad's son. Now, do you have uh, siblings or? I have a brother that's older. Okay. Um, Does he still live over in the North Carolina area? Is that where? No, he drives a semi truck cross country. Really, yeah. really. So, the uh, so you is is that where still some of the family roots and family yes, home? Yes, my mom and dad still live still live there. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So yeah. so that's all still part of the part of the family heritage, is, I guess. Yes. They don't farm it anymore. They're in their eighties, so. So going from the farm into the chemical engineering world, that seems like, a, I guess there is some correlations there, but it seems like a little bit of a jump. It is a jump. In high school, I liked chemistry classes. And Something so, that intrigued you? Yeah, when I went to college, I, I thought I was going to med school, and so I did chemistry and biology. And gotcha. Ended up I didn't want any more uh, schooling <laughs> after that. And, you know, you, you talked about the farm background. Uh, uh, there's something different about growing up on a farm. There is. Um, and uh, it is fascinating. Yeah. Uh, I have three siblings, so there was four of us. We all married um, kids that grew up on farms. Really? All four of us did. Now, and this wasn't just locally, right? I mean, I found my wife yep. in North Carolina. Um, my sister found her husband in West Virginia, and he ended up being a, a minister, a preacher for, for his whole career. Um, but all four of us married kids that grew up on the farm. It's definitely, I didn't technically grow up on the farm, but I kind of did. I mean, I was involved with it, but it's definitely a different lifestyle and mentality, I believe. Um, that's a hard one to describe, Tim, but I know exactly what you're talking about. I don't know how to put it into words. There's just a different way of thinking, and uh, <clears throat> uh, it, it, it culturally now is... is seems to be some degree of separation right I mean, yeah the, it's, the city folks just don't get it you know they say uh, but on the other side the the city folks think the rural people are just hicks and, and are ignorant and neither is true no there's i mean both sides bring good points but the, but the separation seems to be growing farther and farther it does. and uh one of my favorite memes <clears throat> excuse me one of my favorite memes i always see on uh facebook or instagram or wherever you want to see it is the is the combine going across the field harvesting corn and the person down below goes, don't they know they can just go to Kroger and buy it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's funny, but it's not. You know, yeah, right. it, it, it's, uh, I wish we could find a way to describe that better. I'm sure people listening to know know what we're and, talking about. And but. that kind of a, lends itself into one of the areas that we, we try to we try to address on our channel. Um, we, we don't make any pretense that we're actually farmers but we do go to the family farm and right. when we do our videos on the farm they're not really geared toward <clears throat> other farmers uh to be able to to learn like yeah. you might you might go to uh how farms work or millennial farmer or uh welfare farm Welkers. some of these others and, and a lot of a lot of them are geared toward other farmers um, now i know zach at millennial farmers trying to help provide some education there but we focus to try to to try to make the farm and what's going on there relatable to folks that really don't have any experience there. right so to get kind of get back on track here with the podcast i guess um you guys are living together now and in, in carmel he's begging for a tractor you're finally giving in over here so we so we got us a tractor is this correct yep got the tractor and we had <clears> a, a garden size i think was 30 foot wide and maybe 50 feet long <laughs> it was all we had for a garden so um we, but our very first video was uh, using a, a, a cultivator uh, to cultivate our corn. We so had some sweet corn. We had a row about 25 feet long. At no point whatsoever to run a cultivator. Yeah. I mean, we still get. I mean, I got a comment this week on that old video. Really? That said, it would have been better to use a hoe. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and besides, there wasn't any weeds in it anyway. I was just playing. So this this begs the question: Is uh, you bought the tractor? Uh, did it? 
come with a Police Star YouTube channel sticker on it somewhere. Somewhere along the lines there, we had to make a decision to, to post a video, I guess. Well, we didn't really. Christy mentioned earlier how we sent DVDs to the extended family, right? Well, I got tired of making those DVDs. It was hard to burn a DVD. It was gotcha. a lot of software to go through. And you, well, I found that I could just take whatever we did with our camera. Again, is it boring yet? Is it boring yet? Press stop. We did zero editing. And we would upload those videos, and we uploaded them to YouTube. By this time, both of our families had internet access. Not good quality, but enough right. internet. And uh, both were in their early 80s or somewhere around 80. And so we we said, I, I don't want I don't want to try to make them private. I don't want to try to. It's just going to complicate things. I'm going to make these videos. Just make it as simple as possible. And tell them. And so we sent the we sent the link and. Um, before you know it, we had 50 views or 100 views. And Grandma likes it, but she's not watching it that many times. <laughs> yeah, um, so so we, we thought, what's going on here? And then we got a comment one day. What? <laughs> so you really got into YouTube by kind of accident. Pure accident. Now, I had a co-worker. That's fascinating. I had a co-worker who had a 12-year-old daughter that he came in, and he was grousing around, and he was complaining because his 12-year-old daughter was making more money than he was. Um, and she had a, a, a YouTube channel about Barbies. Really? And uh, she was she was making six figures. So I knew there was a way to make money there, um, but I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't. That wasn't our ambition. You know, we we, we and so when we did start getting views, I, I, I we were early in the YouTube days before there was any limit lower limit on how right. to monetize a channel. Right. And this would have been about 2015 ish. Fifteen, yeah. And so we, we, we monetized our channel, and that was kind of painful at the time. Um, but one day I came home and we made a nickel. Wow. And I told Christy, I said, this is a gold mine. And I told him he was crazy. <laughs> you sound so much like my wife, it's scary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then it became kind of a game. Yeah. You know, could we make a dollar a day? Right. You know, could I, could I make the tractor payment? You know, that would be amazing. If I could make the tractor, I could so, justify this. So, in, in, really in there, was there like a time where it went from sending links to family to what was the turning point of, was it the first comment? You're like, maybe we should start doing this more for just family. When did you stop making for the family and you started making for the world, I guess? Yeah, yeah. Probably after the third or fourth episode and I realized that people were actually watching it, then it became fun. Um, again, a game. Right. You know, and then when we monetized it, I, honestly, we probably never would have started the channel without this monetization. And it wasn't because of the money. It was because that was a way to keep score. It's hard to describe. That's an that, interesting that way nickel, to put it, yeah. That, that first nickel. It was a way to me measure your success, maybe? Well, that's probably a better way to say okay. it. We, you know, we made that nickel that day. And then, like I said, I set a goal. Can we make a dollar a day? Right? And if I'd had to wait till 1,000 subscribers, we, I, I would have... It, yeah. To me, I was rewarded by a dollar a day. It right. wasn't again. It wasn't about money. It was about wow. That was more successful than See, yesterday. See that that uh, that just absolutely fascinates me to hear your like overview of it because mine was uh, mine was completely different. It was not driven by uh, you were kind of keeping score by pennies, I guess, or nickels or whatever. Yeah. And mine was about building a community. You know what I mean? It's. Uh, I'd shut down a few businesses. I was trying to kind of fill some time. I like people, and it was a way to connect with the world. I, I like, I don't know if diversifying myself is the word, but I like seeing how people do what I do in other places of the world and, and being able to talk to them about it and use the platform in that way. Now, I'm not going to lie. The money's nice. <clears throat> but uh, my way of keeping score was, I don't know if subscribers was the way, but the interaction with the channel, I guess. You know, I think part of that was uh, we were earlier. And, and that's a good point. Um, so when I say it, it, it almost sounds like it's some sort of greed or something. And that's well, not I don't what think, I at all. No, no, no. no, no I, I don't think you were doing it for the money. That was just your way of tallying your growth. It, it, right. So when we were looking at buying a tractor, I couldn't find any videos that I was pleased with. Right. Um, there were two other YouTubers that were actually, you know, actively YouTubing at that time on little tractors. One of them still is a YouTuber, that's Paul Short. Um, he has a little Kubota. Uh, he makes mods now for Kubotas and I would watch him. Uh, he's in, in uh, Prince Edward Island, I think, or somewhere, somewhere up, in, up in, in, that, really? in that area. Uh, and then the other one that had a John Deere's, he was Roy Rector and uh, Roy quit YouTubing a long time after, or sometime after that. But uh, 
Roy was was pretty good and pretty interesting, but I couldn't find anybody that would show me close-ups of the attachments operating. Um, just make me feel like I was there so I could understand what tractor I needed to buy and what right. attachments I needed. And so one of the objectives for us early on, and you can see it in our early videos, is we, we, we wanted to actually show what does it look like, what does a tiller actually look like when it's running? What does the soil look like after it's done? What is it? It, it, is, it, is a tiller really something I want, you know? And so we, we made an effort to get close-up shots, uh, a lot different style than people were doing. Now it's all over YouTube. So right. it's, it's a totally different world now. So you were talking about building community. There, there was no community hardly to Right, be that's a good point. When, that's a great when point. When I was there, we were probably, my purpose was probably more about providing the content so that people could find that content. You know what, I'm going to go a little bit off base here, but you bring up an excellent point. You know, one of the, I'm sure you get this question from time to time, you know, how do I get started in YouTube? How do I have a successful channel on YouTube? And uh, I think you and I did a little bit of the similar thing, maybe a little bit by accident a little bit, but we did some research on other channels and, and studied what those videos were missing or what other people wasn't providing and then tried to kind of fill that niche a little bit. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, and uh, I, I, it, it does make sense. But on the other hand, don't follow anybody. No, no. But uh, I guess my point was, is you know, uh, I get a lot of credit for explaining stuff well, and I do that because I watched other videos where they were leaving out some very elementary stuff that a lot of people don't mention because it's elementary. So I tried to add that, and you were saying that you were you couldn't find that on YouTube, right. or that was a missing void. So, yeah. uh, what, I, what I find fascinating when we talked off camera. Uh, before we started the podcast here was uh, how uh, different our styles are yes and and by the way your your success is amazing and it's only going to shoot through the roof i mean <laughs> i i, I, it, it, you're I appreciate gonna be that. incredibly successful at this it just takes a little time to to, to get the message out but uh, the way you explain stuff is and, and your skill your knowledge it, it's, it's amazing so you're you're going to be super successful. You haven't even seen the tip of the iceberg yet. <laughs> I appreciate that. But uh, I, I just noticed the difference. And, and one thing I would encourage people is to be themselves. Absolutely. And to, and to Absolutely. Do, do what you do. And don't don't worry about what other people do. Yep. Um, and to be passionate. Yes. I mean, that's one thing that he's passionate about these tractors. Right. And it doesn't matter the color. Yeah, we have green. But... He talks about it all the time, not just when we're on YouTube. <laughs> and so I think that's important. If you're going to start a channel, don't just do it because you think you're going to do it. Uh, the authentic, authentic, I can't even say that word. It comes through. Yes. You can tell that on camera. You can't. There's just some things you can't act or fake. Um, and there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot to that. There's no, no doubt whatsoever. I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm very passionate about ICF and excavating and what I do. And. I want to share it with people. You know, that's kind of where where my channel come from is uh, finding other like-minded people and other people in the industry and bouncing ideas off each other. And, and uh, two heads are always better than one a lot of times. So. That's a great side benefit, the community. It's, it's, the tractor world is great people. We have found so many like-minded people that when, you, when they meet us, we can already talk about stuff because they have some of the same passions right. and it's like you're a family even though it may be just seeing them face to face for the first time do uh my my you guys know my neighbor longer way he's we can all agree at the table he's crazy <laughs> <laughs> but uh he's actually a very 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 intelligent guy and, and whenever i started youtube he said there's one thing he goes the best thing that ever come out of youtube is the people you meet and the thing that youtube is the best at is aligning like-minded people they know what your history are what you like history your watch history is what you search what you do and they kind of get you guys grouped together and i can't argue either one of those facts they they do a great job of that and that, and that is the best thing for me that's come out of youtube is the people i've met i've met some awesome friends from coast to coast and i'm stunned i continue to be stunned at how many quality people Oh, it's incredible. There are it, incredible. And, and, I mean, it's it's easy for us to get to get so depressed that uh, you watch the news. I, I don't care what your political affiliation is. You if you just watch it, it's just so depressing. And uh, but the people we meet and and the people we hear from uh, are are just 
it's it, it, it's it's uh it's a shot in the arm it's a boost to the, the, there's there's hope you know i don't know yeah. i know we're getting a little off subject here but <clears throat> yeah it's it's a it's uh it's been a good thing for me in a lot of different ways and i think you guys have been doing it longer than me but experienced a lot of the a lot of the same thing so but uh, getting back to the tractor so we we have a tractor now we got this new thing youtube it's kind of gaining some steam um how much effort were you guys con- you know putting into it trying to like thinking this may be a retirement project or this may be something that we can do in the future or, or, or putting plans together of that nature probably for two years it was still a game okay so we're yeah. just kind of pushing the buttons and seeing what outcome we get over here yeah it's kind of a hobby a hobby and so i did it i was doing it all myself except for my daughter uh, my daughter and i kind of made this a a, a project for for both of us katria was oh i don't know junior in high school at the time sophomore junior and she, and she was on the channel a lot in a lot of the earlier videos i know she's studying abroad now and, and comes back occasionally but yeah she uh she was she was uh instrumental in getting it going i think i think people were fascinated that a father and daughter could actually get along and enjoy each other's company there's so many yeah. families that, that struggle i got uh, i got higher hopes for my daughter taking over my excavating business than i do my son <laughs> <laughs> but we had we it, we we found it to be a time that we really enjoyed together yep um and of course anytime you're you're dealing with a, a child growing up nothing ever stays the same right so it's not a it's not a case of, of uh Thing you know, a negative change. It's right. a case. Well, she's got her own dreams to, to chase. Right, right. She's got so, you know, yeah, I mean, decisions ways, to make. In some ways, I wish she could have stayed seventeen forever and uh, helped us with the channel. But it, it's it's become to a stage now where she's got larger dreams than we could ever ever dream to be a part of. Right, yep. and uh, she's pursuing those. We're we're totally behind her and and uh, still happy to have her come home. Once in a while. <laughs> That's awesome. That is absolutely awesome. And yeah, I've uh, the. The videos I've watched on our channel, I've always enjoyed. And of course, I've got a daughter that's quite a bit younger, and it uh, it's inspiring. You know, I, she she shows interest in it, and, and I'm the same way. Whatever she wants to do in life, I'm going to support 100. percent But whatever quality time I get to spend with her in the shop or on a tractor or on a piece of equipment, I'm going to take every every bit of advantage of it I can. And that's what's that's another aspect of YouTube. You get to see that growth, and you get to see the change, right? Christy wasn't very much involved in the channel back then. She, it, it, for her, it would be a, a, a little respite, right? I mean, Katrill and I would go outside and have kind of our dad and daughter time together, right. and then I would do all the editing at that point, and Christy would have an hour or two alone that she didn't have to be um, doing mama tasks. And uh, so, you know, we then experienced that change. You know, Katrill went off to college, and, and uh, at, at some point I started discussing with Christy. I said, I can't do all this editing. We tried to get more regular with our producing. You and, and you were yeah. still working full-time at this point, right? Still working full-time. And, um, and, and we began to see, I don't know what time this would have been. It would have probably been 2017. We began to see that there was maybe some steady income possible. Gotcha. It wasn't enough to, to survive uh, by any means, but it, we, we thought that there might be a chance for it to be enough to cover Christie's expenses, you know. Um, Justify her time that she yeah, puts right. towards the channel. So we talked about one evening, I said, look, we either need to quit, because I just can't do this. We either right. need to quit YouTube, or we got to do something different. And I said, well, why don't I quit my job and <laughs> learn how to edit video? And he said, you'll do that? The next day I went in and I went into my boss's office and I said, I quit. I'm giving my two week notice. And they knew we did YouTube. Right. And she asked me why. And like, well, if we're going to give this a shot, we got to do something different. The, um, I don't want to go too far down this road, but I, I think this is a conversation maybe you and I can have, you know, a lot of people that don't do YouTube. I think there's a mythical world out there about how much money you can make or what's available. And, I guess one thing I want to kind of point out, and we, we discussed a little bit off camera, is, you know, a lot of it's based on views, not subscribers, and not all two channels are the same. So you can have big channels making less money than small channels or, or vice versa. It's There's no proportional unit of measurement uh, based on, on what you're going to make off YouTube. I, I don't think you can say if you got 50,000 subscribers, you're going to make X that year. Does that make uh, sense? Subscribers have no, no impact on them. Right. right. And the first thing I would say to folks is, um, uh, I, I, what, I, what I hear is, 
well, that's easy. You just wave a camera around for a couple of minutes a week. Right. And and then you you wait and free stuff starts falling out of the trees. Don't you, you wish it was it. that easy? It's not. Um, it's not easy, and and in a sense, we wouldn't want it to be easy. I mean, it's it. We want to provide a quality product for people. We we want to provide entertainment. We want to provide right. quality information. Exactly. And, and so we work hard at it, and that's the only way you retrain viewers is is to to provide quality content. My, my answer to the first statement is, is it's pretty much free to <clears throat> pretty much free to start a YouTube channel. If you got an iPhone and an email address, have at it. Um, but if you want to be successful at it, it's just like anything else. You got to put effort into it. Yes. You know, that's the simplest way I know how to put it. You have to respond to the viewers. You have to make sure that you're providing content that people want to watch. Yeah, in the in I don't know I don't think you can be disappointed with the outcome and I don't think you should get over ecstatic with the outcome. You should just be happy with what you got. Does that make sense? Within uh, You have to. I mean, uh, there are ups and downs uh, in this and and you know, there everybody I think every YouTuber that I know that's been doing it long term, it's it's easy to get burned out. It is. Yeah. Um, it is. I think you've been doing it a couple of years. Um you're you're due for I'm the first I'm round I'm, I'm round. still in the honeymoon stage. I'll admit it. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's the down months. It's when, when your view count was going upward and then all of a sudden it goes downward and you publish what you think is a better video that has great information. Uh, we published one this morning that, that I thought was just a fabulous video talking about the tools that I carry in my pocket. Right. And, um, it's not getting a very good start. Well, you, you have videos like that and you kind of go, Hmm, what, what am I doing wrong? You know, so it's easy to, it's easy to get discouraged and more so after you've been doing it for a long time and you feel like you have it kind of mastered. Mastered, yeah. something changes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you guys have got way more experience in that department than I have, but I've heard these same conversations from Logger Wade and other guys that have been doing it. Is you kind of run for a while and you plateau for a while, yes. and you run for a while and, and plateau for a while. But I guess that's when you kind of got to just dig your heels in and, and keep going. And, you have to change. You have yeah, to and, and, and adapt, with the, uh, adapt with the times. And, you know, we get uh, thousands and thousands of comments, which is feedback. And, you know, there's uh, – I know I read every comment I get. I believe you guys do as well. Yeah. And I think that's a big deal to a successful channel is, is listening to the people watching and trying to um, answer their questions and making them feel like their their question was warranted. Does that make sense? And, and going down that route. It does. Uh, it's it that's perfect sense i think the the comments are very important we try to respond to a lot of the comments and we we try to pay attention to the comments right. <clears throat> um, there's a little balance there um because some of the negative comments are are probably not wholesome for us to take too seriously right and, and we discussed this a little bit off camera as well as um you, you got to take them for what, what they are face value. You know, some of these people comment and, and there's no way they could have that strong of opinion with what little bit of information you gave them. Um, but I personally still want to acknowledge them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, sometimes I don't even recognize. I, I forget that, that everybody's in their own situation and their own moment in time. Uh, I had a negative comment, a really negative comment. It's been a year ago now probably, but... I actually responded to the guy, and, you know, I probably wasn't real kind to him. And several hours later, I got I got a reply. He says, "Oh, he says ignore that. I was drunk." <laughs> you know, and I it never even occurred to me that the guy, you know, that there would be a guy out there. Hey, just, I'll give him props for being honest. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Give him give him props for being honest. And I think uh, we, we were discussing this earlier too. Everybody deals with that a little bit different. Um. Uh, you know, I think we kind of recognize or realize that it's part of YouTube. It's It kind of comes with the territory. And I don't know if you get more callous to it the longer you do it, but um, I'm kind of the guy where 90% of them don't bother me that much, but every once in a while I'll get one that cuts pretty deep, and I'm like, yeah, all right. Well, I think for, for me there's there's a bunch of them that you, you get a negative comment and you know it's not true. Yeah. You just know you just know it's an inaccurate reading, and, and I don't have any problem with those. It's the ones that have that, that, that hit a sore spot, right. that hit an area where maybe I, 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 I may have a weakness or I may, I, you know. You get you second guessing yourself a little bit. Yeah, yeah, those are the ones that sometimes really, uh, really cut. But we try, to, we try to deal with that. 
I can't say that I'm perfect. Uh, Christy probably should take my phone away. Uh, yes. On some, on oh, my some wife does the same thing. Yeah, I, I'm over there. and My wife, whenever she started her channel, she got her first negative comment, which had to do with parenting. And it was a it was an absolute BS comment, but oh boy, we about had World War Three in our house. So I'm like, all right, <laughs> slow down, let's take a deep breath. You know, you gotta you know put yourself in this guy's place. You know, it, it, it's, it's that, that's what's funny is that uh, the, the the same people that tell you, oh, just don't worry about the comments. If the uh, the tables turn sometimes and the comment is directed at them, it gets old. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, it, yeah. And that's probably enough time. I mean, look, we we love our viewers and right. we really appreciate oh, them. And yeah. and um, and ninety nine point nine 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 percent of them are amazing. And it's just Absolutely. so easy to dwell on the negatives, but it's so hard to, to to dwell on all the positive. And then the folks that don't comment. I mean, we we once in a while we do get a comment. I've been watching you for five years. This is the first time I've ever commented. Or we'll meet someone at a trade show. Some I love the meet and greets at trade yep. shows. I've never come in. In fact, I'm not a subscriber because I just I don't even know how to do that. You know, uh, uh, we we get a lot of we have we have a lot of people on our channel that never subscribe. We talked about this. Yeah, and it, that's uh, that's interesting. And and I know everybody's got their reasons, and that may be a whole other conversation. But uh, I get a lot of that same. We Same have a stuff. lot of viewers that are that are older, and they they really have no idea what it would even mean to have a Google account or a YouTube right. account. My grandma is eighty five years old, and she reads every comment on every video I ever posted. It gives me a report card when she sees me. Uh, oh wow, that's awesome! <laughs> and well, that keeps you from having negative replies. Well, and, and she's never commented, and I'm pretty sure she's not subscribed. But if I do something that's questionably unsafe, she usually takes their side, and I hear about it. Uh oh. <laughs> So, yeah, we could talk all day without talking about the safety. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so but um, I guess a little bit. So you guys have uh, you have a successful YouTube channel now. Christie's uh, quit her job to help that. You ended up following suit a couple years later. Um, so what? Uh, I forgot how you worded this earlier, Tim. But you basically have a, a business that feeds the YouTube channel, where I'm kind of the opposite of you. Did I get that right? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I look at you and I think, how in the world are you doing this? I, I really do. I don't see how you're able to to take on a big job like we're in a house foundation. You've got help that's working working with you, and at the same time, you're you're publishing uh, quality content uh, frequently on YouTube. I, I don't see how you're doing it. He's younger than us. Maybe that's it. <laughs> she be. might she might be onto something. Uh, you know, my biggest trick I found as far as time saving is the method in which I film. That, that saves me a lot of time um, on the editing side, but I don't get all the detailed shots like you guys get or some of the nuances or, or some of the um, commentary or the cards you guys throw up in the text or stuff like that. That's where I kind of fall short because of my time constraints, but I kind of know my limits. I kind of budget my time, and I got to stay within my budgeted time of, of what I need to do and the I, I kind of hold myself pretty strict to that, to be honest with you. It, it's it's that's fascinating. Good. I think I think that's what we're talking about about finding your own way. I mean, that's yes. my advice for people. And what works what works for me or what works for Tim may not work for Jason yeah. or Adam or. Right. You have different assets than we have. I mean, uh, we we have a little bit of a luxury to have Christy to be able to do this Absolutely. more detailed editing, and so we we do pride ourselves on some better editing. We pride ourselves on better audio than than others. Some better camera angles than others. Um, that's that's really the way we use to set ourselves apart. But the biggest thing that we think we do that we try to set ourselves apart is uh, is character. Yes. Um, you know, we we do show a lot of sponsored product, um, so that more so than than you do, I know. But you're very transparent about it. And what we say about a product is what we really feel about a product. You know, yep. if if we show a product that. A product may not be really useful to us, but we will find the area that it's useful for. Right. Right. I, I mean, I really think sometimes that's that's the situation. A guy looks at a product and he says, "Oh, this this product sucks" or whatever. That's typically not the case. Typically, it's just it's meant for a different niche than than right. I have or he has. So what we'll try to do is we'll we'll look at a specific product and we'll say, "Yeah, this might not be for all of our viewers, but." If you've got this particular need right here, you've got this particular challenge, 
this product might be great for you. The, the other thing I want to give you guys a uh, huge credit for, and, and Christy was not here, we had this conversation, is um, if somebody's looking to buy an attachment or a tractor for the first time, I'm going to call them the entry level person. You guys do an awesome job of explaining stuff on a very elementary, professional level of things to take into consideration, things to look at, different what different ratings mean, uh, if you're going to use it in this application, what to expect, because you guys got tons and tons of examples. You guys put these tractors in pretty much every situation imaginable. I'm sure there's one out there we're missing somewhere, but um, I mean, I'm pretty diverse in the equipment. My stepdad came to me and wanted to buy, me a track, wanted to buy a tractor. I said, screw me, go check out this link in, in your channel. And I think he binge watched it for about four days and made a decision. <laughs> which, thanks, Tim, you saved me a lot of time. Uh, say to yeah. <laughs> but, but no, he complimented you very well about, he, he's not a tractor guy. It's his first tractor purchase ever. And you, you were able to resonate with him and educate him in a way he could understand. Well, it's intimidating for folks. Thank you. Thank you very much for saying that. But it's intimidating for folks to go to a dealer. It is. These it's dealers, still intimidating for me, and I own millions of dollars of equipment. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I... I'm especially intimidated to go into a dealer of your type, the excavation equipment. I, I don't know. I, I My few times to be in an, a, a construction equipment dealership just scares me to death. Foreign territory. Yeah. But even ag dealerships uh, are, are a, a, a bit scary, too. When I, I feel like when I go in and I say, I want to talk to you about a 25-horsepower tractor, I feel like they're going to say... Um, yeah, just uh, go look online somewhere and yeah. come back when you're ready to buy. Uh, they really don't have that attitude at, at most dealers, right. but it feels like it. It I, does. I it, it's like something it. about the environment of the place. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know how to describe it, but um, I don't know if it's because they're always competing with each other, so they're always trying to outdo one another, and I, I don't know. I have no it's, idea. I have no idea, yeah. but... But that is something that we try to do, and, and we get a lot of questions from people that clearly need to go to their dealer to answer. Right, right. right. But they, they're just scared to go in there. We, one of our best series, we, we went and, and did dealer shopping uh, for I you think know, I remember buy a larger these. Yeah, tractor. Yeah. We just took the GoPro, and we walked right in and, and kind of shopped the, the dealer and, and, and four or five different manufacturers, or de local right. dealers, you know, and... Uh, those were big hits, and I guess the reason they were a hit was because people were intimidated to do that. Well, yeah, themselves. it gave them a what-to-expect type of experience. So um, one other thing I want to give you guys huge props for is um, uh, you guys got a relationship with your local John Deere dealer. Right. Um, I, AHW. AHW. And uh, you're kind of, I wouldn't say you're solely John Deere, but that's kind of the main focus is the 1025 on the John Deere tractors. But the, the series I watched that I really took a lot of notes from when everybody was doing my Volvo versus Hyundai comparison was the uh, Kubota versus John Deere. And um, what a very good unbiased set of videos that was. It was, it was just facts and, and, you, and you actually showed visual examples of those facts. And uh, you weren't saying, you say, weren't saying one was better than the other. You're just saying this is what this one did. This is what that one did. Yeah. And, and, and we didn't know what we were going to see when we started into it. Right. I mean, we knew the tractors were similar. Uh, we knew they were... And they are the two biggest brand names. Oh, There's yes. a lot of them on the market, but those are the two most and recognizable. That's we chose them. Yeah. Right. And we, we tried to come up with tests that you wouldn't see in the spec sheet. And we also real, tried to... Real life. Up, yeah. Uh, one that really shocked us was the turning radius. Yes. Um, the, the spec showed it a one-inch difference. Uh, what we saw was the diameter was was 28 inches different. So in other words, over 50% worse on one of the ones yeah. than the other. And we still don't know why, you know, one of them must measure it differently than the other or something. Right. What the, the part I found fascinating was the three-point hitch, because I've never been a big fan of the orange three-point hitch geometry, but I think it ended up being stronger, but it didn't go as high. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I think it may have even went as, it, it just didn't stick out very far from the track. Yeah. Right? Um, but I think that's what made us stronger, and it and it was it was the probably the biggest win for the BX. Was yeah, the three point yeah, edge. yeah. And uh, we were really surprised at that. Yeah. I was too, because that's one of the bigger complaints I had about those. And then here you turn around, and prove me wrong that it was actually stronger than the than the yeah. the greener competitors or whatever. Yeah, so, so uh, you know, we a lot of people were saying, oh, we were biased, and we were well. I I don't know how you could watch that video and think you guys were biased. That was one of the best we jobs. Tried hard not to be. 
Yeah, and like it that. and it showed, and I and I think you showed faults of each, and you also showed pros of each. I mean, uh, they. Uh, I think at the end of that, the only one you thought was better than the other was your opinion you got from yeah. the information. And I tried to stay that. Yeah. I tried, you know, I, mean, so I, I don't feel like, look, everyone has a bias. Right. You know, to, to say I'm unbiased is, 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 un, is just, that's, that's False a False statement. Everybody has a bias. But I think it's an insult on my character to say that, that I can't be fair right. in spite of my bias. Right, and, and so that's what we try to do. We try to say, look, we're going to be as objective as we possibly can be. We'll state areas of opinion, but we want, we really want to just show a, we, we want to show information that, that we Right, well, yeah, yeah, you know, provide the information so the viewer can make a decision, an informed decision. So um, wrapping up here, Tim, what, another big part of your guys' channel is not only the tractors, but all the attachments and all the goodies that go with it. And you guys, you guys have demoed a lot of stuff. And you got very detailed videos on the majority of it. I mean, it's pretty incredible. We we really have, and uh, we couldn't do this without the support of these manufacturers. Right. Right. And uh, uh, just like the viewers are trusting us to be fair and to, to give everybody a, a fair shot, so are the manufacturers. I right. mean, they, they watch our videos. They we never have content restrictions on our videos. I just want to make that clear. To yeah, everyone. and I, I think that's that's um, that is a huge statement. I, I have turned down stuff because they wanted to. I call it by words, and I'm, I'm not going to do it. it. It's if you want to if you want an honest review. But I've also found Tim that most manufacturers are very receptive to your input, no matter what it is. I mean, they 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 take constructive criticism very well. And we were discussing this earlier. A lot of these people that design this stuff don't necessarily use it. So getting it, you know, a ground level input, they they appreciate. Yeah, and but we have found that, you know, I don't think we've had a single attachment around that we haven't found something that we thought could have used some improvement. Been and improved. we state that in the videos. Right. And the manufacturers obviously see those videos, but they there's a difference between saying, um, I don't like this about an attachment versus. This attachment sucks. Don't ever buy it. Right. And um, I, I don't think many attachments deserve the latter. No, and, and you're you're very similar to me in, as far as approach. That if there's something you like or don't like, you try to show examples of that and, and give reasons why you do like it or don't like it more than just your and maybe opinion. Maybe a way to work around it. Right. Right. Because right. There, there, good there point. Is, there, there is no perfect mower. Good for point. Example. Yep. You've got. I don't know, 10 different types of mowers, none of them are perfect. What, what works good on your yard may not work good in my yard. And even parts of your yard. And so you're going to have parts of what you're doing is going to be a compromise. Well, just know that when you purchase this mower, you're going to compromise uh, either cut quality or your, your handling of your ditch bank. Or, right. or maybe it's going to be too heavy for your tractor. But you figure out, and you, as long as you know when you get it, what yeah. your compromises are, then we've done our job. That's what we try to do. We got more attachments coming this year. Awesome. Um, how long can this last? And how many attachments <laughs> are there for? Well, I've been asking myself that. <laughs> well, you've, been a, you've already built one building out here. You may have to end up buying the neighbor's property over here <laughs> to store them. So, yeah. it's, uh, it's like Christmas pulling in the driveway of this place. So. <laughs> but, uh, well, Tim and Christy, we can't thank you enough for all the awesome videos. I know you've provided some uh, invaluable information to a lot of people out there. And I know there'll be a lot more, a lot more videos, uh, videos coming but uh, in closing here what uh, you just want to give some maybe some highlights of the YouTube experience or YouTube give away or YouTube um, highlights or, or any advice you want to give anybody getting into YouTube or well, I think we've covered I think we've covered most of the yeah. items. I, I really think that the main thing is be of high character yes be dependable be uh, I think be you got to be somewhat somewhat transparent you just can't show all the highs you got to show the lows too and because uh, it's real life it's hard work it is hard it's work. It's not easy. Marketing videos that you see, you notice the equipment's always clean. Mm -hmm. The equipment, uh, usually it's driven by some beautiful 20-something-year-old lady that's never probably operated an attachment, and as soon as she gets off the set, she'll never operate again. That's not what it's really You know, in, in closing real quick, it brings up a conversation I had with uh, Volvo versus Hyundai. You know, um, I think it's very well documented. Um, I got a Volvo sponsorship to go to Vegas to their Conexpo booth, all this brand new fancy paint and, and all this stuff, and and did a video for them. And then um, I went to the Hyundai booth and was doing the same thing. And the marketing lady said, "Well, what do you think we can do to push this forward?" I said, "I'll be honest with you, 
I said, this video I post right here, it may get 10,000 views. I said, if this video was on my, if this machine was on my job, I said 40,000 views all day long. So people want to see it working. Yes. People want to see it in action. And uh, that's proved true. You know, Hyundai did send, send me a machine. We got views. They sold equipment. And it, uh, they, seen the, they seen the benefits of it actually in action, which is what you guys excel at, is, is getting that attachment, getting that tractor, putting it to work, documenting what you see, and relaying that to the public. Yeah. And so, you know, I would look uh, in the comments section uh, below on this, on this particular podcast if if you've got feedback for us, we'd love to hear it. Come on over to our channel, Track Time yes, with Yes, absolutely. Um, and I will link that in the description of the uh, description of this podcast. And hopefully, by the time this is out, we're on a few other podcasting platforms. But uh, cannot thank you guys enough for sitting yeah. down having a conversation. And check out our channel. I think we're going to have uh, Mr. Dirt Perfect. I can't call him Mr. Perfect. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> on our on our channel. Just for uh, the record, Mr. Dirt Perfect was an accidental joke for the channel name. It just kind of got, got, wow. got stuck with it. It's supposed to be Dozer Dad. It was the original name. But thanks for coming and visiting us. Yeah, thanks for having us. This was uh, we've. Uh, I'm glad we at least got an hour of this recording because we've had some incredible conversations here. You guys are just awesome stand-up people. Do an incredible job with the channel, and uh, keep it up, guys. Keep it up. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So, but uh, I think we're going to sign off. Another uh, episode in the books again. Thanks a lot. Don't forget to guys check out your guys' channel, Check Your Time with Tim. I will uh, post the link below. And uh, thanks for everything, guys. Thank you.